Somalia, a country without government, a nation without a state, no rules, no institutions, no one to protect and control the Somali people. They survive on their wits and their traditions. They endure. With no central authority, the link to the outside world has effectively been severed. Somalis feel forgotten. Without services, people rely first on family and community. But there is change afoot, a new actor on the stage. The ruined capital, Mogadishu, has been taken over by the Union of Islamic Courts. The city is now controlled by a single authority after 15 years of clan-based factional fighting. This is a major event for the stateless nation. And in the newly opened port, a significant humanitarian development, the safe delivery of food aid. The sight of food aid being offloaded onto trucks and taken out of Mogadishu to other parts of the country is remarkable. For 11 years, it was impossible to use this port, a major flashpoint for fighting and looting. So the new authority brings both opportunities and challenges. Order and security has been established in the capital for the first time since the collapse of the government in 1991. Professor Ibrahim Addo, foreign affairs representative for the courts. Our biggest challenge is to go beyond peace and provide so social services. Uh, to serve the basic needs of the Somali population, whether it is food, medical care, shelter, uh, clean water, all of this we have to provide. We have to indicate to the world exactly what we are doing. We want to pacify Somalia, we want to help the Somali people, uh, we want to, uh, the unity of Somalia is very important. We uh, have to defend the Somali population. The Union of Islamic Courts has expanded into much of southern Somalia with military might and moral authority. Sharia law has been imposed, and seminars like this one teach the principles of the Quran and the need for national unity. But the challenges are enormous. Somalia is one of the most difficult countries in the world to help. In Mogadishu, there are thousands of displaced people living in camps like this. They fled fighting years ago. Poverty and insecurity keeps them here. They live on the edge of survival, like Mohamed Isak, who makes traditional toothbrushes to sell in the market. What he earns buys a bit of food every day, nothing else. For years, the displaced have received no assistance, apart from the occasional gift from Muslim charities and when security allows a little support from international organizations. This elderly woman from Baidoa has been sick for years, says her family. She has never seen a doctor and they cannot afford to buy her medicine. A generation of Somalis has lived this way for as long as it can remember. There is no formal education system and only a handful of private schools. Most are educated like this. In the local Quranic schools they use ink made of charcoal and wooden boards to write on. Healthcare is very poor. Here, ambulance by ox cart. Somalia suffers one of the worst mortality rates in the world. Médecins Sans Frontières runs this clinic in rural Merere. People travel for days to get here. 
A few of the main hospitals are supported by international agencies, like the Medina Hospital in Mogadishu, assisted by the International Committee of the Red Cross. Here, a boy shot in the stomach. He survived for a week before he got transport. Most rural hospitals can't function unless crucial supplies arrive. So people depend on the drugs sold in the market, if they can afford it. And so in Mogadishu, many have welcomed the arrival of the Islamic courts. There is hope at last. Business is thriving. The new authority has given people a framework of order and protection. These market traders are no longer restricted to simply protecting their lives and their money. They can now work safely and plan a future. Armies of volunteers are clearing the streets. Streets blocked by waste were a health risk and an obstacle to city life. This team shifts decades of rubbish, including dangerous unexploded ordnance. It is the most worthwhile thing Ahmed Jumali has done for a long time, he says. <laughs> The change in Mogadishu comes after a particularly bad year in Somalia. There has been one of the worst droughts in living memory. It has been a challenge even to maintain a traditional livelihood in places like Afmado, southern Somalia. This cow is called Majen. She is the last from a herd of 40. For her owners, cattle are their life, their survival. When the entire herd died from drought, the family moved to the outskirts of town. They now depend on menial work and handouts. Halima feeds the children when she can. Her only hope are some orphaned calves. They get tea in the morning with the children and sleep with her at night. Halima's husband Mohammed was the proud owner of 40 head of cattle before the drought struck. Almost overnight, the family have joined Somalia's countless number of poor and displaced, scraping together a pitiful existence on the edge of town. Now, the future is dying before their eyes. By early morning, Majen is dead. The body is dragged away from the compound to join other carcasses, but the smell of death hangs everywhere. A funeral pyre for the dead. A new season and rain drips into the family home. Mohammed is angry and bitter about his situation. Halima gets distressed and leaves the discussion. Mohammed wants to know why he has received so little during these years of crisis. This is how he sees it.
Somalis lost their place in the world when the central government collapsed in 1991. Dictator Mohamed Siad Barre was driven out of Mogadishu. U.S. troops arrived when Somalia became anarchic under competing factions. Civilian suffering was enormous. There was widespread famine. Aid was hijacked. It was one of the spoils of war. Intervention by the U.S. and U.N. failed to bring peace and in 1995, international troops pulled out. Humanitarian assistance could not do what it needed to do. We still have no one permanently based uh, in uh, Mogadishu. Maybe. Delivering aid to Somalia has continued to be a problem, explains Philippe Lazzarini, senior humanitarian official for the UN. We are still in an environment which is very explosive, extremely fragile. Um, today, I mean, we, we might even be on the eve of, uh, of a new fighting so, all over the country. So I would say the security situation is definitely a concern. Because assistance is scarce in Somalia, there is always a scramble to grab it when it arrives. Keeping track of it is difficult. In Afmado, during the drought, there was a lot of food aid in the shops and a lot of complaints from the poor. But without an accountable authority, it is impossible to find out what really happens. And conflict is back on the agenda. Here, Sheikh Sharif Sheikh Ahmed, chairman of the courts, declares jihad, holy war, against neighboring Ethiopia. The U.S. accuses the courts of harboring terrorists. Sheikh Sharif accuses Ethiopia of having troops inside Somalia's borders. Somalia's neighbors have thrown their weight behind the internationally backed transitional federal government, the TFG. Formed in exile after nearly two years of talks, it is a government in waiting. It resides in Baidoa, preparing to get established in the capital. So the Islamic courts prepare to fight. Military camps retrain the young militia who preyed on society so long and re-educate them. They will fight again. Now they say it is for their country and their religion. People are told to prepare for jihad. After the years of chaos, there is an appetite for discipline. Here, the scene after an execution of a murderer by an eight-man firing squad. Strict religious and moral standards are being imposed by the courts. What does the future hold now? Not everyone is happy about the change. In the shadowy markets and back streets of Mogadishu, people complain their cinemas and entertainments have been closed down, and cats, a traditional narcotic leaf widely used, has been banned. <laughs> And so a humanitarian opportunity could quickly turn into a humanitarian crisis. Somalis are fleeing their country again, most, it seems, out of fear of what might happen. Here at the Kenyan border, Somalis wait to be taken to a camp. Some have been refugees many times. Jeff Wordley, protection officer for the UN Refugee Agency, receives people as they arrive and tries to cope with the new influx, arranging transport and shelter. Many of the people who have arrived in these, in these camps and have come into Kenya uh, have been reporting the reasons for their flight as, as the fear, not just because fighting has affected them, but also the fear of, a, of major fighting. And that seems to be one of the driving factors uh, in, in people's flight. Um, secondly, there seems to be a number of people that are arriving who um, are objecting to um, Sharia law in Somalia, which is perhaps not surprising when one considers that it was a relatively secular country, um, and including um, the, uh, the fact that they are not receiving any form of assistance. And it, they've just found life just too difficult to, to survive. 
Camp life means shelter and food, but sometimes bitter competition for basic resources. Tensions from Somalia spills into the camp. Here, a fight over shelter, and the Kenyan police move in. Neighboring countries are nervous about security on the Somali border. Then the worst regional floods in years, and many Somalis who have just struggled with drought find themselves dispossessed by water. Flash floods overwhelm the temporary shelters of the new arrivals. Flooding affected most of southern Somalia, causing more displacement, but temporarily holding back fighting. I'm very, very concerned and worried about uh, the near future of uh, Somalia. I think the, the Somali Somalis have uh, shown an incredible uh, resilience uh, capacity. In a country, for example, where you have malnutrition threshold above 20%, this would trigger massive uh, humanitarian assistance, whereas in Somalia this has become the routine. I mean, people are going from an uh, unprecedented drought to one of the worst flood, and we are speaking about adding to this, uh, to this uh, people a possible uh, broad-scale uh, conflict in the country. And uh, we really hope that uh, if that would be the case, uh, to allow I mean, these uh, people to get uh, the necessary assistance, protection, and their human dignity to be respected. The future hangs in the balance. The international community continues to weigh the options. The nation is still without a state. And so Somalis, for now, remain in the twilight zone. Thank you.